The center of the Milky Way is a story of intense radiation, gravity, and mystery. A place where the forces of nature are pushed to their limits. But what if our own planet were to find itself in this cosmic theater? What would happen if the Earth were located there and somehow managed to survive? Let's start this journey to the heart of our galaxy and find out. Picture this. You're floating in space, surrounded by billions and billions of stars. Suddenly, you see a bright swirling mass of gas and dust in the distance. That, my friend, is the Milky Way galaxy, our home in the vast expanse of the universe. The Milky Way is estimated to contain over 100 billion stars and is about 100,000 light years across. In other words, if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way from one end to the other. It's a couple trillions of miles. And it isn't just a static collection of stars and gas. It's a dynamic, evolving system. In fact, the Milky Way is currently hurtling through space at a speed of about 1.3 million miles per hour. One of the most fascinating things about our galaxy is its shape. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, which means that it kind of looks like a disk with a central bulge and spiral arms. The spiral arms are the areas where new stars are born. It's where the most stars, gas, and dust are concentrated. And this is where the solar system is located. Our system is like a tiny speck in the grand cosmic tapestry of the Milky Way. It's about 26,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. A pretty long distance, isn't it? The solar system is also moving through the Milky Way as it orbits around the galactic center. It takes about 230 million years for our system to make one complete orbit around the galaxy. Just imagine that. Since the time of the dinosaurs, we've traveled just a quarter of this way. The position of the solar system in the galaxy affects our life in many ways. For example, things like the amount of radiation and cosmic rays we're exposed to, and even the likelihood of asteroid impacts, and so on. Also, thanks to our location, we can enjoy some pretty amazing views of the universe around us. From our vantage point in the Milky Way, we're able to see other galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters in breathtaking detail. We're also a part of a pretty happening neighborhood, with lots of other stars and planets nearby. So we're lucky fellas. But what would happen if we weren't so lucky? What if the Earth was located in the center of the Milky Way instead? The center of the Milky Way is home to a region of space called the Central Bulge, and it's just packed with stars. It's like a disco ball, but instead of shiny mirrors, it's covered in stars. Only this disco ball is really huge about 10,000 light years in diameter. The center of the Milky Way is also home to some extreme environments that would make even the bravest astronauts shiver. High energy particles and intense magnetic fields can wreak havoc on electronics and spacecraft. Intense radiation fields can fry anything in their path, so it's not exactly a friendly place for life as we know it. So, if the Earth were located somewhere closer to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, it would be a very different place. Let's take a look at some of the potential effects. First of all, radiation. As we mentioned earlier, the center of the Milky Way is one of the most radiation-dense regions in the galaxy. It would make life on Earth very challenging, if not impossible. Sure, we have the Earth's magnetic field, it's like a giant shield that protects us from harmful radiation from outer space. But could it protect us if we were located in the center of the Milky Way? Unfortunately, the answer is no. It's kind of like trying to use a tiny umbrella to protect yourself from a massive storm. So it would be an easy win for the galaxy. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are some brave organisms that are able to adapt to high levels of radiation. We've seen that life on Earth has evolved to survive anywhere, from the depths of the ocean to the icy poles of the planet. So, 
let's imagine what would happen if we somehow evolved to survive in these harsh conditions. Like, picture humans with tough, scaly skin that protects them from radiation, and plants with unique structures that allow them to thrive in this bright environment. In that case, radiation could still have some seriously spooky effects on us. For example, it could damage DNA molecules and cause mutations. Imagine a world where plants grow with five leaves instead of four, animals have strangely colored fur, or people have unusual eye colors or other unique features. And these are just some of the best examples. Let's not dive into the bad ones. Also, it could cause us to undergo some metabolic changes. Maybe our bodies could process food and other resources more quickly, which could lead to faster growth rates and larger sizes. Plants could grow tall and thick, and animals would be much larger than usual. There are also some organisms on Earth that are able to bioluminesce. Thanks to high levels of radiation, these organisms could potentially glow even brighter than usual. Imagine walking through a forest at night and seeing trees, mushrooms, and even insects glowing with an eerie blue or green light. Frightening and amazing, isn't it? But let's move on to the next big change, gravity. The gravity in the center of the Milky Way is incredibly strong, all thanks to a supermassive black hole, which is about 4 million times the mass of the Sun. This black hole is called Sagittarius A. And yep, it's our neighbor now. Great. And assuming we don't get swallowed by this black hole or crushed by this incredibly strong gravity, it still could trigger lots of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. This black hole would be like the gravitational bully, pulling and tugging at everything in its path. Basically, if we survived this, we'd have an epic surfing competition every single day. Just add a bit of the thrill of risking your life and forget about running away from the planet. No easy rocket launches anymore. And physical objects won't be the only ones affected by gravity time would flow very differently for us. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, time passes more slowly in areas of high gravity. In other words, Earthlings would age more slowly than someone far from the center of our galaxy. Also, the center of the Milky Way is a very busy place. Stars, planets, and other celestial objects moving around at incredibly high speeds there every day. The positions of stars and other objects would be constantly changing. In other words, say goodbye to normal navigation. The GPS system would likely be unreliable due to the strong gravitational forces and high radiation. So, if you accidentally got lost in a glow-in-the-dark forest with some creepy animals, good luck. But it's not all bad. The center is also home to molecular clouds. These are the regions of space where new stars are born. And the Milky Way in general has some pretty amazing sights to offer. For example, stunning nebulae like the Orion Nebula and the Eagle Nebula, which are visible with telescopes or even just a good pair of binoculars. So if Earth were located in the center of the Milky Way, we would have a front row seat to some of the most spectacular cosmic events. Wouldn't that be awesome? Overall, if Earth were located in the center of the Milky Way, it would be a very different place. Of course, we all understand that our planet wouldn't have survived such a change, but it's still pretty interesting to imagine how our life would flow if we were there. And judging by what we just discussed, it wouldn't be pretty. So let's treasure and appreciate our small, quiet solar system. So you're driving down the highway, and an 18-wheel tractor-trailer is coming up fast behind. You've got to change lanes. You look in the mirror. Is there enough space? And you notice the words on the mirror. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. No kidding! Well, it's the same with the Milky Way galaxy. There's another galaxy headed this way, and like the tractor-trailer, it's closer than it looks. The Andromeda Galaxy, or M31, as it was labeled originally by Charles Messier in his catalog of 110 fuzzy objects in 1774, is now officially named NGC 122, that's New Galactic Catalog 122. 
a spiral galaxy larger than the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy is so big and so close that you can see it without a telescope. In fact, it appears with the unaided eye half as wide as the Moon. It's estimated that the Andromeda Galaxy contains 1 trillion stars, compared with the Milky Way's estimated 300 to 400 billion measly stars. To see the Andromeda Galaxy, you must allow your eyes to become dark adapted. This might take about 10 minutes while your pupils dilate to take in as much light as possible. M31 is best seen from late summer through winter, when the great square of Pegasus the Winged Horse is overhead. Draw a line across the great square diagonally upwards from the lower corner star, then go a little further beyond the square. There it is! But you still won't be able to see how big it is, unless you peek at it from the corners of your eyes. If you stare straight at it, the galaxy will tend to fade away. You must use your peripheral vision to see how big the Andromeda galaxy appears. Peripheral vision, or averted vision, allows you to see light more sensitively at night, but without color. Sailors have used averted vision for centuries to see faint lights out on the ocean or on land. Aristotle used averted vision to observe star cluster M41 in Canis Major, as he described in his book Meteorologica. In a telescopic photograph, the Andromeda galaxy appears six times wider than the Moon, because with the unaided eye, we can only see the bright center of the galaxy. A telescopic photograph shows how massive M31's spiral arms really are. And this beast of a galaxy is headed our way. We are looking at a future massive collision of galaxies of, well, galactic proportions. When that happens, humanity may need to relocate to another galaxy to inhabit. Perhaps we'll go to the pinwheel galaxy in the asterism of the Big Dipper. How do we know the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us? With a tool called a spectroscope. After the camera, the spectroscope is the most important attachment to a telescope. Oh, except for the human eye. Our eyes only see light. You don't have this big horse in your eye. You only have the light being reflected by the horse in your eyes. The same with space. We only see the light coming from there. So, if we are going to understand space, we need to understand light. And that was not an easy task for astronomers of the 19th century. The invention of the spectroscope was a big breakthrough in understanding light coming to Earth from space. With a spectroscope, astronomers can tell which direction objects in space are moving, as well as which elements are making the light. When you hear an ambulance approaching, you hear the siren getting louder and higher. And when it passes you and goes away, you hear the siren's sound get weaker and lower. The change in pitch frequency depends entirely on the motion of the source. This is called the Doppler effect, after the Austrian physicist and mathematician Christian Johann Doppler, who first explained the effect in 1842. The ambulance siren is not changing its volume. The sound waves are being compressed as it is approaching and stretched as the ambulance recedes. The spectroscope shows that light waves show the same Doppler effect as sound waves. They are compressed as the star or galaxy is approaching us and appear stretched when it is receding. Therefore, the light from an approaching galaxy will appear slightly bluer, the blue shift, a slight increase in frequency, and the light from a receding galaxy will appear slightly redder than normal, or red shift, a slight decrease in the light's frequency. In 1929, Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble spacecraft is named, published his spectroscopic study of 46 galaxies, the light from all but one of which was redshifted, moving away. Hubble's study provided the first evidence that the universe was expanding. The farther away a galaxy was from the Milky Way, the faster it was moving away. This was also the first evidence that the universe began with a Big Bang. The one galaxy whose light was blue shifted, moving towards the Milky Way, was M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, the closest galaxy. 250,000 miles per hour seems a pretty high speed at which to have a collision. That's the speed spectroscopic measurements of the blue shift of Andromeda indicate. It's going to be a big mess when it happens. But when is it going to happen? To determine when the two galaxies will collide, we need to determine the distance between them. And for that, we need, boom, supernovas. Type 1a supernovas are what are called standard candles. Just as we know how bright a candle shines, we know how bright a Type 1a supernova shines, its absolute magnitude. 
A Type 1A supernova appears when a white dwarf collapses under the pressure of all the gas it has been gravitationally slurping from a companion star. Looking at the Andromeda galaxy and measuring the apparent brightness of a supernova in the galaxy, it is possible to calculate its distance away from us. Because the intensity of light dims inversely with the square of its distance away, which is called the inverse square law, by comparing the apparent brightness of a supernova in the Andromeda galaxy with its absolute brightness, well, we get an approximate distance of 2.5 million light years. Since one light year is approximately 6 trillion miles, and the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away, even though it is approaching at the speed of about 250,000 miles, we have about 4 billion years before the big collision. So you can wait until after lunch, maybe dinner, to start packing. As an aside, if we see the Andromeda galaxy as it was 2.5 million years ago, and it has been moving toward the Milky Way all this time, how big in the sky would it appear now? Quite as big as that tractor trailer in your rearview mirror. But do we really have 4 billion years before the galaxies crash? There are several other factors to consider. The minor galaxies that are gravitationally linked to both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy will be swallowed up by their host galaxies. Considering the lopsided mass distribution that will result, the galactic collision of the Milky Way and Andromeda will be affected. Some scientists are saying it won't be a direct hit, but more of a sideswipe. And then there's the galactic halos of each galaxy. Here's what Project Amiga has found out about the halo of stars and gas surrounding the Andromeda galaxy. Using the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were able to observe how the light from bright distant quasars were being absorbed by the mostly invisible gas around the Andromeda galaxy. Look at the results! Notice M31 in the center. If the same is true of the Milky Way, and there's no reason to think it would be different, then the halos of the two galaxies are touching now. The collision has already begun. There is also a question about what effect the dark matter clouds around each galaxy might have on an impending collision, or are having now. But enough of speculation. In 4 billion years, the sun will have increased brightness on its way to becoming a red giant star. And humans will have already found another galaxy to inhabit. Happy traveling, dear humans! The Milky Way is one of the biggest mysteries out there, literally. It's hard to figure out how big our home galaxy is. And one of the main reasons is because we live in it. Think of it as walking around a mall. You can tell it's big, but you can't be certain until you actually see it from a bird's eye view. The Milky Way consists of billions of distant stars that look like a string of lights from afar. So you just need to measure the distance between these stars and voila, you have the answer. Eh, not really. I might have forgotten to mention opaque clouds of dust blocking your view. Some scientists were stubborn enough to run computer models of how galaxies form and evolve. There's a halo around our galaxy, so the scientists wanted to see if there was some sort of a dead end in the Milky Way. They found out that the Milky Way spreads for 100,000 light years away from its center. It likely means that the entire galaxy is around 200,000 light years across. The problem with this estimation is that halos don't tend to have some final border since they simply fade away. It's like pointing a flashlight and trying to see precisely where the light ends. In 2013, the Hubble Space Telescope captured an image of something 25 million light years away. It turned out to be a spiral galaxy, later called ESO 3738, with at least seven other galactic neighbors. And this galaxy is as thin as a pancake. A very shiny pancake. The telescope also took a photo of another galaxy cluster 65 million light years away. It was called IC 335. It's another glorious glittering pancake floating in the vastness of space. The images the telescope took aren't the most accurate. It's hard to tell what exactly you're looking at. These disk galaxies have lots of dust clouds that can stretch for hundreds of light years across. They're mainly located near the centers of galaxies and are invisible in regular light. But they can be detected with the help of a blue filter. Anyway, this IC335 galaxy is an oval disk with huge clouds of gas and dust. This means stars constantly appear there. But not all galaxies create stars. A galaxy is born as a giant ball of slowly rotating gas that is steadily collapsing in on itself. As it starts spinning faster and faster, the pancake shape is formed. Ooh, pass me the syrup! 
It's like spinning pizza dough in the air after rolling it into a ball. The topping is stars, and the sauce is clouds of dust and gas. Are you getting hungry like me? Some galaxies can lose their gas and dust if they become part of a galaxy cluster. Then all these mini-galaxies orbit their common center of mass, with gas separating them. When a disk galaxy dashes through them like a speeding train, the pressure can blow away this dust and gas. From far away, it looks like you're staring at a DVD you're about to play. But if you traveled millions of light years to get a closer look, you'd see a dim disk filled with stars. You wouldn't even be able to tell you're inside it. You'd also see a bright blob of dust left by the red giants in the middle of the galaxy. Red giants are massive and very bright stars with low surface temperatures. But the images of these galaxies don't actually show us their real color. Cameras make up some of these hues so that you don't have to look at something fuzzy or grainy. People don't actually know the real colors of distant galaxies. Our galaxy has a lot of gas inside, like me, so we don't need to expect our home to dry up anytime soon. In fact, the Milky Way still produces new stars around 7 a year. But some galaxies fade out when they can no longer create stars. In the industry, they call it strangulation, and it happens when galaxies run out of gas, which means there's no more new material that can be used for star making. Gas and dust aren't the only things you can find in a galaxy. Just like a magician pulling a rabbit, flowers, or other things out of their magic hat, galaxies have other surprises. Like planets, those balls of matter spinning around themselves and around other things. Well, technically, planets are far from being perfectly round in shape. But they aren't also flat like spiral galaxies. It's mostly because of gravity. Its force is so strong that a planet pulls everything towards its center, taking the shape of a sphere. In the process, all the edges and anything else that might stick out get smoothed out. But the smaller a space body is, the less round it is. Take a comet. It doesn't always have a smooth surface. It's small, and therefore, its edges are rugged and pointy. Given the size of Earth, it's safe to say the gravity is strong here compared to that of the Moon or any smaller size space object. And because of our planet's constant rotation, there's an outward bulge on Earth. This tug of war between the gravity pulling inward and the planet's spin doesn't allow Earth to be a perfect ball. On top of Earth not being a perfect sphere, the planet is also tilted. This design flaw is responsible for the seasons we have. This tilt could happen because millions of years after Earth was formed, it probably collided with a protoplanet, a large space body developing into a planet. Venus is unique because it rotates backward compared to the rest of its peers. If you were standing on Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, you'd see the sun rise in the west and set in the east. But you'd have to make it on time to observe this phenomenon. A day on Venus lasts for more than 240 Earth days. For a long time, scientists believed that the sun's strong pull on Venus was responsible for such a long day. But new theory claims that Venus used to spin just like Earth and the rest of the planets. But at one point, it just flipped its axis 180 degrees. It doesn't mean the planet abruptly stopped halfway through the rotation and started to move backward. When theory suggests that a large comet or object struck the planet in the past, this might have caused it to change the direction of its rotation. But many scientists doubt this theory. If you observe the moon for some time, you may notice that it's the same face staring at you every night. The truth is that the moon does rotate, but very slowly. It takes our planet's natural satellite 27 Earth days to rotate around its axis. Plus, the moon rotates at the same rate that it orbits Earth. The side we always see is called the near side of the moon. And the side that's not facing us is, you guessed it, the far side of the moon. It also has the nickname the dark side of the moon. Uranus's rotation axis is 98 degrees relative to the plane of the solar system, which basically means that the planet spins on its side. For a while, scientists believed that a large object firing through space knocked into Uranus, causing it to tilt. But here's one problem. Uranus's moons are covered in ice. A collision so powerful that it made the planet tilt would have resulted in disrupting the moon's movement and their position. But they seem relatively untouched and all the ice covering them is still intact. But any major changes happening with Uranus would have generated enough energy to melt the ice. Another reason for Uranus's strange position might be its rings. 
Yup, Uranus has rings just like Saturn, except they're lighter and fainter. Saturn's rings are mostly billions of chunks of ice and rock floating in orbit. Some particles can be the size of a pebble, while others can reach the size of a house. Wow. Other particles are broken up comets, asteroids, and moons torn apart by Saturn's gravity. If you observe the rings from afar, they look like colorful stripes made up of thousands of different streaks, but there are actually only eight layers of rings. Uranus might have had rings that were just as glorious as Saturn's around 4.5 billion years ago. The balance between Saturn's gravity and its rings might be responsible for keeping the planet upright so that it doesn't tilt over. If Uranus had the same rings, they could prevent the planet from toppling over. The way to solve Uranus's tilting problem might be for the planet to get its rings back. They would help Uranus keep its balance. On the other hand, hey, we like it just the way it is.